need a chair up here for Phyllis, I think, so that would be great. Um, so Phyllis Chesler is an emeritus professor of psychology and women's studies at the City University of New York. She is a best-selling author, a legendary feminist leader, a psychotherapist, and an expert courtroom witness. Please come up here, Phyllis, yes. Expert courtroom witness. Dr. Chesler is a fellow at the Middle East Forum. She has published thousands of articles and most re recently studies about honor-related violence, including honor killings. She has published many classic works, such as Women in Madness, Mothers on Trial, The Battle for Children in Custody, and Women's Inhumanity to Women, and most recently, An American Bride in Kabul, which is her 15th book, and they have it for sale in the lobby if anybody would like to pick up a copy. That book has just won a National Jewish Book Award in the category of biography, autobiography, and memoir. Dr. Chesler is a co-founder of the Association for Women in Psychology, 1969, and the National Women's Health Network, 1974 to 75. She is a co-founder of the International Committee for Women of the Wall, 1989 and ongoing. Chesler pioneered work about motherhood. She published With Child, a Diary of Motherhood in 1979, Mothers on Trial in 1986, an expanded, updated edition in 2011, The Sacred Bond. The legacy of Baby M in 1987, I know, it's just amazing, right? She organized the first ever Speak Out of Mothers in Custody in 1986 and spoke at a similar Speak Out in Toronto. Are you absorbing all this, Dr. Chesler? She was challenged by the FBI to appear before a grand jury in the matter of one particular mother who had run away to protect her daughters from being sexually abused by their father. She also organized weekly demonstrations outside the courthouse in the Baby M case and spoke at the press conference after the New Jersey Supreme Court rendered its verdict, which outlawed surrogacy in New Jersey. Chesler has been consulted by matrimonial lawyers and in the past has testified for mothers. Today, she submits affidavits and dispenses advice when asked, and those of us who know her and love her ask her often. I'd like to have Phyllis say a few words, please, now, before we, oh no, we're gonna present the award first, yes. Okay. All right, so, um, Phyllis, yes. uh, from your son, yes. Oh, it's one, oh, yes. Uh -huh. I just wanna just, yes, go for it. just for one second, it's very brief. All I have to say is, if all you did was pass your teachings on to me, so I could pass them on to your granddaughters, Diane, that would have been enough. <laughs> and you've done so much more. Yeah. And again, this award will hang in the museum in perpetuity wherever we go. So thank you. Uh, please sit down, use the microphone to whatever you I will try. try to stand. Okay. All right, you try. And I have to sit. I will sit. Okay, good. Perfect. Uh, yes. Yes. All right. So, yes. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I'm really thrilled to be honored in my work by the very visionary Museum of Motherhood and by its pioneering founder, Joy Rose. Where are you? Right here. Now, in 1977, when I became pregnant by choice, always by choice, a dear friend and a leading feminist urged me to have an abortion. She said that I was too important to the movement to spend my time being a mother. I laughed, but I hugged her too. I thought that becoming a mother is a major human rite of passage, and I decided to write a book about it. Well, guess what? Editors rejected the idea. One man said that the subject had already been done. And I said, by who? Dante, Cervantes, Shakespeare? <laughs> Sir, I think not. Another man said, but you would not be a normal mother. Other mothers would not be able to relate to you. A third editor, alas, a woman, said to me, but you can write a real book. Why waste your time on a bullshit subject? The editor with whom I eventually worked was a man, by the way. At the time, I was a professor at a university, City University of New York, where I had already been teaching for eight years, since 1969. And I asked for a temporary change in schedule so that I could nap in the afternoon. <clears throat> Mind you, I had already published two books. I was working on a third, many influential articles. I mean, I was a committed professional. The dean twisted his face into a sneer and said, 
why don't you make up your mind? <clears throat> Do you want to be a teacher or a mother? <laughs> now, <clears throat> the late, great Margaret Mead had a very different response. We debated each other and bonded. And she came to visit me when I was pregnant as an elder of the tribe. What are you doing about your nipples, she asked. <laughs> you have to rub them hard with a washcloth to toughen them up. <laughs> Scared me to death. <laughs> toughen them up for what? <laughs> my beloved son was born, I published with Child a Diary of Motherhood. And mothers who are starved and who are starved for literature that took this experience seriously, even poetically, loved the book. And oh yes, I had a boy, not a girl. And in those days, some feminists thought themselves entitled to critique it. And critique, critique it they did. I should have had a girl, not a boy. <laughs> Incorrect. And over the years, I thought so many strong, radical feminists had boys. Nature wasn't laughing at us. This is how you make a feminist. Mother by mother. Woman by woman. In the mid-1970s, the mothers began to find me. First lesbian mothers who were fighting for custody who wanted me to testify for them. Then totally straight stay-at-home mothers who were losing custody to violent or absent fathers. My new theme had found me. Please understand, when I began with child, when I began Mothers on Trial, there was a little else like it to draw upon. There were some excellent law review articles, very few, and only a handful of motherhood memoirs. I labored on Mothers on Trial for eight years and published the first edition in 1986. It was panned, it was praised, I was interviewed quite a lot. I launched the Speak Acts that Joy Rose referred to, and um, it wasn't a bestseller. Father's rights groups threatened to sue my publisher. Father's rights groups dogged my every step, demonstrated outside the Speak Outs. We organized both in New York and Toronto. A small feminist press crushed the book, and it took time to get it back up and running. I know it became the Bible for so many mothers. It received very little academic recognition. Yay, Andrea Riley. Very little academic recognition. It was excoriated in some of the mainstream media, often by feminist reviewers. Mothers began to run away <clears throat> from wife batteries and child abuses and to protect their children, and some turned up at my doorstep, and how could I refuse to help them? Many feminists did refuse because it would be a political act that you could risk going to jail. And um, I was proud that I was one, that I was womaning one station on the Underground Railway for mothers, for runaway mothers. Most mothers got arrested and served time in jail. And I got into big trouble, as Joy Rose pointed out. The FBI came calling, looking for one particular mother. <clears throat> and I would never talk, but they found her a few days before the grand jury in Buffalo was going to question me. And then my lawyers warned me never to contact her. I began writing to her immediately. <laughs> and when she was released, she came to visit and apologize for having given up my name. And I said, my dear, you have nothing to apologize for. You put me in the history books. <laughs> and then in 1987, I did launch demonstrations outside the Baby M case. Many liberal feminists thought I had lost my mind, a deal is a deal, contract is a contract, she has no education, what kind of birth mother, who cares about her? Her lawyer, Harold Cassidy, saw it through and it was declared against public policy surrogacy, has again reared its head, it's a very ugly head. And I and a number of other radical feminists foresaw, including Barbara Katz Rothman and Jean Pajetta Korea, the vivisection, the vivisection of motherhood into an egg donor, a gestational mother, an adoptive mother, maybe two gay fathers. No woman need apply. And I understood that prostituted women and brothels on India would be chained to the walls and they would be gestating perfectly white babies for very genetically narcissistic couples and or single people. And I wondered, why not adopt? I understand that adoption is risky and that adoption is often hard bureaucratically, 
But why plan preconception to adopt a child away from his or her birth mother? Why not adopt all the children who already have no families and need mothering, fathering? In 2011, I updated Mothers on Trial with eight new chapters, and my friends, things have gotten worse, not better. There are some improvements. Uh, gay parents may not automatically lose custody for that reason, and noble career mothers. Now, what I made of motherhood, Ariel, when he was 20, 18, 18, 18 or 20, wrote an introduction to a new edition of With Child. He's a beautiful writer. It's a gorgeous introduction. And I wrote the afterword. <laughs> and this is in part what I made of motherhood, what it made of me, influenced my work. Before I became a mother, my ego knew no bounds. I thought I could overcome all obstacles through a force of will, not by bending to circumstance or trusting to forces larger than myself. For me, motherhood was something of a reverse Zen experience. I had no responsibilities other than my ideas. I was a nun, a warrior. For me, giving a child was a passage from detachment to attachment. After giving birth, I began to learn the treacherous, graceful art of balancing work and motherhood, self and others. Growing up, like everything important, this is a process, and I'm still learning how to do it. I also began to understand that life doesn't stand still, that it's always changing, growing, dying, renewing, and that we have to change with it as we try to stand still to experience the moment, remember it. And for years, when I looked in the mirror, I always looked the same. It was me. Time only became real for me when I began to measure it by my son's obvious physical growth. He <laughs> stands here taller than me. <laughs> Time became more finite. I comprehended in my body that I would die. As I lifted up the unbearable burden of one small life, I felt like Atlas holding the world on her shoulders. A photographer, Suzanne Theo, may she rest in peace, once visited us. She wanted to take, she was doing portraits of mothers and children. And she asked my son Ariel, how do you see yourself with your mother? What image would you want to project? Blessed boy, without hesitation, he said, I would like my mother to knight me. <laughs> Amazingly, but instinctively, he understood that all mothers are queens. <laughs> each with rite of passage powers, and so I knighted him. The photographer got a sword, a throne, a costume, but we were both barefoot the way we first met. I dubbed him Sir Ariel, first knight of the realm, and the air became luminous, regal, and women wept afterwards, and he treated me with reverence for about seven days. <laughs> Seven days. <laughs> Thank you, Joy Rose. Thank you, my distinguished colleagues. Thank you, all who have gathered here. I will sign copies of An American Bride and Couple. The book is here. It was me. I was that American bride long before feminism. Thank you.